Well, thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. It's great to be away from the snow. Um, to start, um, I'd like to start with a, um, uh, just a very straightforward infographic that um, we had in our first collection from Best American Infographics. And if you look at this, it's, it's um, very simple. It's what birthdays are most common. If you take all Americans and see when are people born. And across the top, you'll see the months, down the side, the numbers of the day. And then the darkness indicates how common that birthday is. So when I was first, this is from the first collection, and I've been working really hard you know, putting all this together. And my son, who was 11 years old at the time, opened up the book. And this is the first one he opened to. And the first thing he said is, Dad, why are there so many babies in September? So we had to have this sort of age-appropriate conversation about <laughs> what mommies and daddies do in the cold winter months. Um, <laughs> So, like all good infographics, this works in stages. At the beginning, the first thing you sort of notice is this strip down here, the September strip, the question my son asked. But then, as you look more carefully, you start to see other patterns. Um, for example, if you look in February, down to February 14th, there's this odd island right here where there's all these babies being born. And likewise, if you look in December, there's this... Not a lot of babies being born leading up to the 20th, but then afterwards you see a lot more being born. And also, this is interesting, July 4th, for some reason babies aren't born on July 4th. So you start to look more <laughs> deeply and see these patterns, which have to do with sort of social patterns, um, relationships. It also has to do with um, conventions, with holidays that we have in the country. So um, the question, though, is why... To me, and the question I want to answer in this talk is, why does this work so well? Why is this such a good way of presenting all this complex information? And why are we seeing so many of these around us now? So um, mostly what I want to talk about today um, is what I see as the deep roots of infographics, what it is about us that makes us respond to infographics? What makes them work so well? I mean, at the end, um, I'll share a few infographics from the collection and give a few thoughts about where it's going. Um, and I'll also try to leave some time at the end for questions. So to start, we have to go way back in time. The year is 1861. Fort Sumter surrendered. The Battle of Bull Run has been a disaster. The American Union is crumbling. And Abraham Lincoln is obsessed with this unusual document. Here it is. It's from the Library of Congress. It's about three feet long. It's a map of the southern states. And what it's showing is um, slavery, the number of slaves by county. The darker areas show more slaves, and conversely, the lighter areas, there's fewer slaves. Um, there was a man hanging around the White House at this time who was there to paint Lincoln's portrait. And he saw Lincoln holding this map all the time. And so he became um, this man, Francis Becknell Carpenter, Carpenter, who was interested in, became interested in understanding why Lincoln was so obsessed with this map. So he took it back to his studio. A little while later, Lincoln came to his studio. Lincoln liked to come visit him to sort of escape the pressures of the office and says, oh, you're the one who took my map. Been looking all over for it. And he took the map. Lincoln sits down on a trunk by the window and starts studying it again. So what is Lincoln seeing in this map? Why is he, what does he find so compelling about it? Well, the first thing to notice is that you see that the southern states are not a uniform block. It's not one thing. There's a lot of variation just by looking at slavery. And two, he starts to have these, this, he sees some, he has some political insights, which is that the regions of the South that are most secessionist are the very regions with the most slaves. Finally, as the war, the Civil War progresses, he consults this map to see the number of slaves that have been liberated. So this is a map. It shows the geography, but it also shows the economic and political terrain of the country. And I think in Lincoln's mind, it also showed the moral terrain. 
So here's the, here's the painting that uh, Francis Becknell Carpenter eventually drew. You can see Lincoln here with his advisors. And I love this. If you look down in the lower right here, you can see the map. I'm not making this up. This is true. When I came across this story, I found it so interesting. First of all, it showed to me just how compelling an infographic can be. If you think about Lincoln and all that was happening, all he had to contend with, the fact that he kept returning to this object over and over again spoke to the power it had to him. Second of all, this story provided an important clue to me. I wanted to know why infographics are so powerful, why we were seeing them anywhere. And this, this story pointed me in the direction, in this direction. It, it said to me that infographics are actually part of a much older tradition, the tradition of making maps. So how far do, back do we have to go? What is the oldest map? It turns out there's a lot of debate over what the oldest map is, but this is a pretty good candidate. This is a stone, could fit just in your fist. It was found 14,000 years ago in a cave in Spain. It's a bit hard to make out, but it has these light scratches on it. And here's a Here's a, sort of a drawing of what those scratches are. When they first found it, when archaeologists first found it, they couldn't really figure out what was going on. And then they thought, well, maybe it's just showing an animal. It's, maybe it's just a drawing of an animal. But then they realized that all of these, that these are rivers and, that, and paths and that corresponded with the area around the cave. And that's when they realized that this is a map, a map that they were, that the the people who made it were using for hunting. So this represents a huge, huge intellectual leap forward. It seems modest, but it's what has just what what has happened to do that. What made this possible is a, a big shift in thinking. This is when people realize that you can take the whole world out there and represent it in something that you can hold in your hand. It's something that you can record, use to record. You can use it to show other people. You can use it to make plans. You can literally hold a world in your hands. So this is the idea of map making. And obviously, it took off. This is a bit hard to see, but it's actually a uh, 14th century map of England. And if you turn your head on the side, that's north and that's south. This is a road map. This is another map from around the same time again. Um, this is north and this is south. So this is the entire known world. This is Europe. This is Africa. Um, at the very center, of course, is Jerusalem. This is a very religious map. And here is, this is Asia, and that's the Garden of Eden. At the end of the 18th century comes another major development. This is William Playfair. He's a Scottish... Um, engineer, political economist, and he had this amazing idea. So let me explain this. Down on the bottom, we have years, and up here, we have amounts in pounds. And these are exports from London to Denmark and Norway and imports. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, this is pretty unimpressive. But it's not this particular, it's not this particular graph that was his innovation. His innovation was the whole idea of making a graph like this, the whole idea of representing data as a line graph. So before Playfair, this information would have looked like this, tabulated numbers. All the, all the same information is there, but it's atrocious. You can't make any sense of it. So instead, he said, take this data. Instead of rows and columns of numbers, take this data Put the variables onto points. So you align your year with your exports. And suddenly, it's in a form that you can process. You can see that it goes up here and comes down here. You can see that imports and exports cross right here. This is immediately apparent. You can learn so much more and so much faster when it's presented in this form. So Playfair, it turns out, actually had a number of good ideas. One was the line graph. He also came up with the bar chart, where the amount is shown by the length of the chart, and even the pie chart. 
good old pie chart. This is the Turkish Empire. It shows the sort of the amount of territory um, in the Turkish Empire uh, by continent. So these are all useful innovations. We see them all the time today. But what's really vi vital here is that William Playfair expanded the whole idea of map making. So think, what is a map? You make a grid and you put the geographic features on that grid. What Playfair is saying is you can make a grid and put anything you want onto it. So you can show landscapes that are biological or political or pop cultural. This, what you're seeing here is the sort of expansion of the idea of map making. So you have these new cartographers who can make new kinds of maps. And this lays the foundation for everything that comes after it. So it still raises this question though, of why does Playfair's innovation work so well? Why is it that putting numbers in visual form allows us to understand them so quickly? And it turns out, and he didn't know this at the time, but it turns out that he'd, he, he had sort of stumbled upon this way of using this incredibly powerful pattern recognition machine, which is the human brain. So to understand the power of infographics, to understand Playfair's invention, we actually have to go even deeper into history. So this is half a billion years ago. This is the first fossil of an eye, and I kind of love this. But next to it, this is a B. You can see how similar the eyes are. So this is an ocean. Imagine an ocean half a billion years ago. If you have eyes, you're going to be much better at finding food. If you have eyes, you're going to be much better at not being eaten. So whoever has vision is king. Over millions of years, the eyes develop, but also the brain develops. Because it's not just about seeing, it's about understanding and understanding quickly. Is that dark shadow in the corner a predator? So a fraction of a second means the difference between life and death. So there's this incredible evolutionary pressure on all of our forebears to develop very fast visual processing. Scientists today call this system pre-attentive because it's something that's happening before you even know you're paying attention. It's like when you're driving a car and you hit the brakes before you're even aware of what's happening. Or something falls off the counter and you're catching it before you're even aware that you're doing it. Compare that to reading. So this is, this is uh, one of the first examples of writing. And reading and writing is, of course, an amazing technology. It's allowed us to gather information and to pass it on um, to the next generation. But it's also very slow. Compare that to this. The moment you see this little thing, your eye is drawn to that, that little dot there, or this. Again, a change in orientation, and your eye immediately sees it before you're even aware. Or this. You immediately see the darker area. And we'll do one more. This is our friend from the beginning, the birthdays. So before you're even aware of what's happening, your eye is looking in September, and you're forming a question. So what I would say is that you can think of infographics as sort of a kind of applied neuroscience. And it's a tradition that goes way, way, way back in time. And all that's really changed is the technology that we have. So think back to the people living in that prehistoric cave in Spain. They could only move themselves as far as they could walk. They didn't have many options for recording what they found. So this map that they made, this hunting map, was a profound advance, but it was limited by the technology that they had at their disposal. Think then about this map that Lincoln was so obsessed with. People had to be able to move across vast areas of the continent. They had to be able to record that information. They had to bring that information back to the capital. Not just the census, but the map making. 
So seeing something like this on this vast a scale is something that those people living in that cave in Spain couldn't even imagine. It would not have even made sense to them. There's one final element of this story, though, that's important. As the technology advances, it also creates this mounting problem. Think about all the information that's coming in to Lincoln's office at the time. There's reports from distant battlefields, vote counts, budgets. All this measuring and accounting and reporting, it easily overwhelms the human mind. And that, I think, is what, in part, drew Lincoln to that map. Sort of the sense of, ah, something that will make sense of it all. And think about the information assault that we are all sort of subjected to do every day. I mean, just think about the information that you've processed since you woke up this morning. There's Twitter and email and television, the great rabbit hole of the internet. Um, and it's common to hear this phrase that we live in an age, an age of information overload. But this actually, this age actually dates back several centuries. There's this great cultural moment when the printing press was invented. So before the printing press, books were this sort of handcrafted thing that took a lot of time and effort to make. They were made one at a time. But the printing press meant that all of a sudden anyone could publish. And these books were just sort of produced in massive quantities that people had never experienced any before. People could write about anything. I love this quote. Is there anywhere on earth exempt from these swarms of new books? Erasmus, 1525. So you can sort of see the parallels to the complaints we all have today. But there's good news. So these swarms of books, there's books everywhere on every topic. Everyone thinks they can write a book. How are we supposed to make sense of it? Someone invented the index. Someone invented the encyclopedia. So with this new technology of the printing press, we had this feeling of being overwhelmed, all this data, and people came up with new inventions that allowed us to make sense of this data and find the one thing that we need. This happens again and again. So there's television, TV guide, there's someone comes along and invents this World Wide Web. There's websites everywhere. Google. And if you look through history, this happens over and over again. It's sort of this arms race between new methods, new technologies for creating information on vaster and vaster scales, and new technologies for boiling it down and making sense of it. And that on the front lines is where infographics are. So that to me is what makes infographics such an interesting field right now because we're at this moment where information technology is exploding and there's this hunger for new ways of making sense of it, new ways of sorting and filtering. And so when we start, we, we sort of all have this feeling of being acutely overwhelmed. And to me, I just find it fascinating looking at all the different ways people are coming up with to fight back that feeling. And that's what this book series, um, this is the third volume we're on now, is sort of about. It's about, been about sort of celebrating the creativity that goes into um, making smart, engaging, comforting infographics. So I'm not going to sort of take you on a long uh, walk through the book, but I just wanted to give you a, a sort of a taste of some of the things that we've had in the series. So um, I thought I would give you um, five different ways of looking at the United States. This is our bro map. <laughs> so if you look on Twitter, Geotags tweets. You can see the different ways people refer to a pal, a fella, a guy. 
and you can map it on the United States. So here's the bro territory, dude country, <laughs> fella runs right through the middle. Washington State does not seem to be participating very much, I have to say. <laughs> Looks like a touch of pal, I would say. I don't know. I don't live here, so I can't really speak to it. Um, but this sort of, um, this, so this is an infographic in the same sense that that map, Lincoln's map was an infographic. But it's making use of the fact that we have access to um, people's social uh, being, in a way. When people tweet, they're sharing what they're interested in, they're sharing how they think, they're sharing um, the types of words that they use. And we can compile that now and put it on a map. And this is sort of a new kind of infographic. It also means that infographics can change. You could imagine 10 years from now, someone might be interested to revisit the bro maps and see if there's been changes. Have, have the dude lands expanded? <laughs> is bro in retreat? These are questions that we'll be able to answer. So that's number one. Number two. So this is the United States... Um, this is all the economic activity of the United States sliced in two, blue and orange. So in other words, if you take all these little orange spots, the economic activity in those areas, and put it together, it's equal to everything else. So what I like about this is the simplicity of it. It boils down this basic fact into one image which is that there are areas of incredible concentration in, the, in our country and then other areas where there's not, economically speaking, a lot happening. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is one of the central um, goals of good infographic work, which is to make it simple, get it to the core. So here's another one I'll just show you quickly. This is an exploration of beer space. It's not displaying very well, but... This is Olympia, there's Sam Adams, where I flew out of yesterday. So these, again, this is using Twitter to figure out which uh, beers are popular with people. Um, and this is the great, so this is the great wine and beer divide. So you can see wine in the middle of the country, beer. Our country is truly divided. <laughs> so this is a different, um, this is a different one, and this is also not showing very well. So this is basically, um, Look in each state and ask yourself the question, what is the language most commonly spoken other than English? Um, so here, in, uh, this is actually Vietnamese. Um, and then there's, these, uh, there's several, several other maps, the most common Scandinavian language, um, the most common Native American language, the most common African language. And what I found interesting about this is it's a way of sort of uh, peeling back the layers in our country, because pretty much everyone speaks English in our country. Most people speak English. And then Spanish is also very common. But then when you get down below that, what do you see? And what does that say about our history? What does that say about the history of each state? Why is Vietnamese the third most popular language in Washington state? I don't actually know the answer to that, but it's interesting. And each of these, each of these uh, data points poses another question. Why is it that, why is it that Russian is so popular in Oregon. So I want to share one more uh, view of the United States. So this is, um, this is actually just a map, in a way. Um, but it's a map that's been shifted back 77 million years. So this is what North America looked like 77 million years ago. Um, there is this great inland sea. This is from National Geographic, by the way. And the reason they uh, put this together is they wanted to show why there is this string of areas right here. Sorry, I keep doing it on this side. You guys are being, oh, you're really being left out. <laughs> All right, I'll keep doing it over here. Uh, so th there are these uh, very rich fossil areas, and it's because it used to be the banks of this great sea. So this, um, and you can see, maybe it's a bit hard to make out, but this is the East Coast and this is the West Coast. They've kind of showed, shown, uh, show here the modern United States, and this is what it used to look like. So if you think back to Lincoln and his slave map, um, and then imagine these five different views of the United States, 
it's sort of amazing to compare um, what we have now at our disposal to what he had then at his disposal. You can take something like the United States and you can look at it in so many different ways. Um, you can ask deep questions about our history. This is literally, you, you know, this, this has to do with the sort of the, um, the, the, the land itself. Or you can ask questions about our um, cultural history, why people speaking different languages have arrived in different parts of the country. Or you can ask sort of more ephemeral questions, like why people use bro as opposed to pal. But these are all things that we now have access to. Um, so I want to take you through, um, those are our, our five maps. So I just want to quickly run through a few more, um, a few more things that I've enjoyed over the years. Um, this is um, from a recipe book that was done entirely visually. So all the recipes are, uh, can be done without reading words other than the names of the ingredients, I suppose. I have a, a younger boy who's nine, and he loves this cookbook. Um, because... Um, I don't know about you, but I, I, I love cooking, but I find it very irritating to have to keep going back and reading, and I can never keep the words in my head for some reason. But with something like this, um, I find it works really quite beautifully. This is a uh, National Geographic. And what we have here is, um, this is uh, uh, lions killing people in Tanzania. And um, this, is, uh, this is the... Um, this is the phase of the moon, and, the, and it, you sort of go through the days of a month. And it, it'll, it shows you um, when the most dangerous times are, which is when uh, there's not a lot of moonlight. Part of what is interesting to me about this is when you think of hunting, you think of us hunting other things. But of course, we can be prey too. And in general, infographics have this ability to shift your point of view. So you can literally stand in someone else's shoes. You can see the world from a very different perspective that maybe you hadn't thought of before. And some of my favorite infographics have this sort of quality of shifting you to a, a vantage point that you hadn't really considered before. We can skip this. This, um, I, I sort of have to include. This is called, um, uh, this is from a website, Spurious Correlations. And this shows a remarkable fact, which is that you look, if you look at the age of Miss America over the last few years and compare it to murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects, <laughs> something is clearly happening here. <laughs> so what this guy did is he took a huge sort of, sort of took all this data and found what was correlated with what, and then just made chart after chart after chart. And I love this. First of all, they're funny. You should, you should, I think he has a book coming out with all these. Um, you should definitely check it out. But second of all, it is a caution to me, um, and I think it should be a caution to all of us, that data can be very easily misused. There's not, as far as I know, a conspiracy that links the age of Miss America to murders by steam, hot vapor, and hot objects. <laughs> but looking at this, it raises questions. It makes you wonder, right? <laughs> So I think um, we all have to be sort of critical consumers of the infographics we see and ask ourselves, what is it really showing? What do we really know from, um, from this data? Um, and it's this, this sort of question is becoming increasingly important because more and more of what the public is seeing is presented in forms like this. So um, finally, I wanted to try to answer the question that I inevitably get when I give these talks, which is, where is all this going? Um, I don't really know. Um, but I will say, um, there's this, um, I do have one very strong feeling about this, which is that um, infographics are just another medium. So it's another way of telling a story. And... I think we've seen um, when infographics first started exploding five or ten years ago, there's this sort of um, just sort of this enth such enthusiasm for them that often th 
they lost their place in the storytelling. And I feel like what we're starting to see now is sort of a, a sort of a maturation. And I think one good analogy for it is to think, you can think of an, if you're trying to tell a story, you can think of an infographic as a good special effect. So, um, for example, let's, let's think of the Star Wars series. I think we can all accept as a historical fact that The Empire Strikes Back was the best Star Wars movie. <laughs> and then after that, things fell apart. What happened? Well, someone forgot that the most important thing is the storytelling. So let's look at a master of storytelling. This is Edgar Allan Poe. In the whole composition, there should be no word written of which the tendency, direct or indirect, is not to the one pre-established design. I actually think about this all the time when I'm writing, which is that you have to have in your mind what is the effect you're trying to achieve and how is this thing I'm doing, whether it's an infographic, a photo, words, how is it contributing to the effect or how is it distracting from the effect? And I think that what we're starting to see as this medium matures and as people get a better sense for what infographics do well and not well and how it can sort of fit with other things is you're seeing a kind of stage managing, more sophisticated understanding of how the infographics can fit in with the story that you're trying to tell. So I'd like to give um, just one, you, you may have seen this, I'll, I'm going to attempt now to switch to my browser, hang on to your hats here. You may have seen this, the New York Times had this um, uh, great story about uh, an attempted free climb on the Don Wall, it's El, El Capitan, it's sort of, um, so free climbing, you base, the basic idea, you climb up the rock, and if you fall, you're probably not going to die, but you're not using ropes to help you get up. It's extremely challenging. And they told this compelling, and for someone who's afraid of heights, terrifying story of these people making their way up the wall. So the context for this is a, there's this story telling this. But then at one point, you can switch to this, um, uh, I would call it an infographic. And you sort of scroll down, and you see pictures. And then meanwhile, on the right, you're seeing the path they took, sort of in 3D. Now what I want you to note is how much is missing from this. It's beautiful. They're just giving you the path, they're giving you a few photos, everything's very clear. You can see them making their way up the wall, we don't have time to read through all the captions. But that, to me, is the single powerful effect that Edgar Allan Poe talked about in his short stories, which is that the pieces are working, um, they're doing their work, but not getting in the way of other things. And then when you're done with this, you can go back and read uh, the rest of the story. There's photos and videos along with the story, but everything is doing its work. It's not extra. Um, so this brings us to the end. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, but I did have to share with you, um, I'm actually just finishing up the next volume of Best American Infographics, um, and um, it will be out this, this October. And I just got the cover, which I'm pretty excited about. I'm also excited to be working with Robert Krolwich. I don't know if we have any Radiolab fans here, but he's awesome. Um, so um, anyway, so this is the cover, which I'm excited about. So thank you. And we'll do some questions. Thanks. So we're doing the Phil Donahue thing. Please raise your, raise your hands over there. If you could just I, give your name, too, oh, it would be sure. awesome. My name's Emily. Um, thanks for that. That was really fun. Um, and I had been procrastinating on buying your book, but now I will. Um, <laughs> I think that a lot of people who are interested in data and maps and visualizations and all that stuff, we have this um, sort of naive theory that information will lead to changes in behavior or changes in action, and we just need to get more information or faster or frame it differently. Um, and it's a trap I fall into all the time and um, with data visualizations, it's like, oh, it makes so much sense now, now people will do things differently. Um, 
do you believe that's true? And do you have any examples of, you know, like, I love, um, one of my favorites is uh, Al Gore's cherry picker visualization from Inconvenient Truth. And I want to believe that that changed people's behavior and that wasn't just like a oh, wow moment. But um, I wondered if you had any examples of that. Um, so I, is it true? I, I sort of have to believe it's true. I'm a journalist and the whole reason I do journalism is because I believe that um, showing people the truth will eventually change things. But I feel like the key word there is eventually, which is that it's sort of too much to ask that if you just show people something, it's going to suddenly change them. Because sometimes people aren't ready to see the truth, even if it's clearly expressed. But I do think um, that infographics do have this very sort of, they can be very powerful because they're so simple. Um, and so that's part of, um, I think that's part of why we're seeing them used so much, is that they have this ability to sort of say, well, <laughs> what do you think of this? You have to grapple with it in a, in a way that's hard to ignore. Um, so I do think that I do think that over time it does uh, it does change people, and we're obviously living through a time when um, there's been incredible social change because because of videos. You know, people have taken videos of these awful police interactions, and that has caused this massive uproar. I mean, it's not an infographic, obviously, but it does. Um, this is, in a way, a new medium. I mean, having mobile phones and being able to take videos like that. And I think that, um, so I think that over time it does have this, this gathering effect. Another question? Yes. He's coming. My name is Wendy. Um, I uh, am a designer that has come from a writing and information architecture background, which is information organization, uh, not a visual design background, so I'm probably in the minority in this room. Um, and data visualization for me has always seemed like sort of something on the edge of design, not something that when you're designing web pages you're dealing with all the time. Um, I found this really inspiring and has oh, uh, really um, made me feel like championing images a lot more than I have in the past. I'm wondering how many of the images you've shown us are from your infographics book, because I would love to be able to get access to those again. Um. So the the infographics are in the books, but they're in a variety. They're, so this is the third volume, and I don't specifically remember which is from which. Um, the uh, the stuff from the Lincoln talk that's just my talk, so it's not in the book. Remember it. <laughs> um, but thank you. That was very nice of you to say. Um, what else? We have another question over here. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Someone over there, come up with the next question. Hi, I'm. Hi. Um, my name is Paige, and I um, just recently read an article entitled "The Infographic Is Dead." Um, and the basic thesis was that infographics were just too complex for the average consumer, and that infographic designers and artists were going into corporate America to visualize all of the big data that companies are now um, acquiring and compiling and using for business decisions. Um, I also worked at NBC News and we did a lot of infographics and I can say that in my experience as much as we loved them and they were really cool we couldn't get our users to necessarily go there enough to support the amount of time and money and energy it took to create those, and so we got diverted into other you know, things. So I'm just wondering what you think about that concept of the infographic is dead, and they're not, they're, they're more for a, a business purpose or a scientific purpose as opposed to a, a general consumption. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a big question. I feel like no, no, <laughs> it's not dead. Um, but it is, it is the case that it's, I mean, it's a form, um, what I was trying to sort of get at in my talk is that it's a form of communication that goes back centuries. Um, and it's constantly changing and the, uh, the art of, is, of it is changing and the business of it is changing as well. And um, one of the things you said early in your question is this notion of it being too complicated for people. And I feel like bad infographics are too complicated for people, but good infographics aren't. It is, however, the case that doing good infographic work 
takes a lot of time um, and a lot of training. Um, and there has to be something that supports that. Um, but I don't think that that support is just going to disappear. I mean, there's a very, um, we sort of gone through a very similar question, which it'll, it'll, this will seem like a strange connection to make, but for a while people were saying newspapers are dead. And I worked at the Boston Globe. Um, I was concerned. I mean, and um, people have said magazines are dead. I'm now a magazine writer. And um, what happens is the businesses get shaken up and you have to find, every business has to find a place and has to find an audience that will support it. But um, other than this infographics work, the other main thing I do is write long magazine stories, which is exactly what a few years ago everyone was saying was going to be dead. Who wants to sit and read a 5,000 word story? People just have two seconds, you know? It's not true. I mean, long stories are flourishing. And I think um, it's also the case that excellent infographic work is flourishing. Um, you know, it's changing. Um, some places are doing it well, some places aren't. There's sort of new models emerging, but I, I don't think it's something that's ever going to die in the same way that, you know, books are never going to die, which is another thing that was supposed to be dead, I think, a few years ago. So keep hope alive. Um, I think we have I time. I think we have uh, time for one question left. So who has the last fabulous question? Who's that going to be? Right here. All right. Fabulous question coming up. Hi, my name is Devish Desai. I work uh, at Microsoft um, in the data group. And my question is pertaining to the difference between infographics and data visualization. Infographics, you have the, as you mentioned, they have the time or you need the time to work uh, the visual in a way that tells the story best. In the case of data visualization, you're trying to put in principles that are far more broader in the sense that you tend to uh, create visuals that in some ways compromise on quality of the storytelling, but have a bit more universal universality to it. Um, in your book or in your research that you continue to do, how do you see those two worlds separating and evolving? So, yeah, um, this is also a sort of a sort of a complex question because people have different notions of what those words mean, basically, I would say. Um, the way I think about it, though, is to think about, um, this gets back to what I was talking about um, when you're trying to tell a story. What is the purpose of your story? Um, if the per and, and so you have to ask yourself, when you're setting out to do an infographic or a visualization, what is the purpose of it? Is it um, that you have a bunch of data and you don't know what it means and you want to try to explore it and maybe spot patterns? Um, which is something, as I was explaining, the brain is incredibly effective at. You may not even know what's in there, but you want to just kind of throw it on the wall and see what's there. That's one approach. Maybe you're in business. Maybe you're um, doing scientific work. I've talked to scientists who've been in this situation. They have all this stuff. Well, let's just see what we have, and maybe a stripe will show up, the September stripe of birthdays. Maybe not. Um, alternately, you may be working on a story. Um, or working with a journalist who's telling a story, and you want, you have a very specific goal in mind. You, you know what the data shows, and you know, and you're just trying to figure out how to pare it down into its essence. That's a completely different mode of thought and a different sort of purpose behind the, the infographic that you're building. So I feel like um, this question just comes, it, it always comes back to what is the purpose of what you're doing. And who is the audience? So, and, and what, what is the audience going to expect and what do they know and what are they going to bring to it? Um, so these are kinds of the basic questions that you want to ask before you do any kind of, any kind of work. And I think that they apply equally well in, in um, infographics or visualizations or whatever you, you want to call it. So um, thank you everyone, it's been great. I do have books, right? The books are here. So I'll be here, happy to answer more questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Gareth. And uh, yeah, Gareth.